Welcome to the castle everybody. This is Nightsaber Z42 and today we're going to be taking a look at the One Ring 2nd Edition starter set from Free League Publishing. I actually ordered this quite a while ago and I finally got my hands on it despite having pre-ordered it. So yeah, my issues with Free League continue. But oh well, let's actually take a look and see what's inside the box set before we go through the individual components. And the first thing I want to show you is the inside of the box itself. And this is the front cover. And already you have things like rules on the inside. That's clever design. I really like that. You can actually use these boxes as like a sort of a, you know, like a GM screen. Um, the other box, the underside of the box, has a map of the Shire area where a lot of the, or actually all of this adventure in the starter set takes place. But that's just so cool. Like, you get a map, you get uh, rules for the starter set, and that's, that's ingenious design. So what about the rest of the components? Well, you have three different books. You have the rule book, which is actually really fairly light. It's like 20... 23 pages, uh, maybe 25, 24 pages long. Then you actually have the adventures, and there's five very short adventures uh, to go through. It gets a little bit bigger, that 32 pages. Then you have a Shire booklet, which details all everything that's in the Shire, and this can actually branch out and expand your own campaign, as long as it takes place within the Shire. And we'll take a look at each of these books here in a little bit. In addition to that, you actually get some cards. These are item cards, and they have stats on the back, just like in the uh, Alien Adventures or the Starter Set uh, they always have item cards, which is always helpful. You could just give these to your players, and then they can actually keep track of the stats on their own, just like so. In addition, you have these stance cards, from what I remember. Uh, these stances are basically tied to combat, so each player gets their own stance card, and it's front and back. Uh, they can have like a defensive stance, a rearward, open, forward, and then I think the other side is supposed to be like traveling, uh, different jobs for traveling and stuff like that and camping. So very interesting that. I didn't really get the full details from just the rules alone, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be expanded upon in the actual core rule book. You also get a set of dice. There are six six-sided dice as well as two 12-sided dice. And the thing about these dice, they're kind of interesting. I really do like the design of these dice. But the 12-sided dice are a little bit wonky. Um, mainly because there are two symbols on the dice. Um, it's kind of really tough to see, but there's a symbol there. And then on the other side, there's a symbol there, which is supposed to reflect either an automatic failure or like, I believe it's um, an automatic success or something like that. And then the rest goes from number one through 10. So I'm sure you could convert that if you were using just regular 12 sided dice, but uh, I wouldn't try it. It'd be just way too awkward. And then you have your six-sided dice, which I really do like the look of. Really interesting. Then you have the characters that actually go with the adventures from Drogo Baggins, Esmeralda Took, Lobelia Bracegirdle, Brace Paladin Took the Second, Primula Brandy Book, Raw Remak Brandy Book, and then we have two secret characters that you can unlock over the course of the adventure from Balan, Sona Fundin, and Bilbo Baggins himself. And this all takes place, I believe, oh gosh, I, the, the specific year is written in the actual adventure booklet, but it takes place well after the events of The Hobbit, when Bilbo actually comes back to the Shire. And so that's why we have things like Balan here. So very interesting, the character sheets themselves tell you everything that you need to know, like all of their uh, target numbers for strength, heart, and wits, any skills that they have and how many ranks in those skills, which equates to how many dice you're rolling, or six-sided dice you're rolling. Um, 
as well as combat proficiencies, um, any virtues they have, and traveling gear. And on the back, you get like a very brief uh, backstory for that said character. So, huh. Primula and Drogo have a son, built Frodo Baggins. Did not actually realize that. Again, I will say I am not the biggest fan of the Lord of the Rings. So, take that what you will. And then you have a fair-sized map, which is really cool. The map is, of course, of the Shire and surrounding areas, all the way up to the uh, High Pass and the Misty Mountains, if I'm not mistaken. And it goes all the way over to the Western Sea, where the Grey Havens are. And on the reverse side, you have a more detailed version of the Shire, which is what is on the inside cover here of your uh, box. So very interesting. And they do flesh out a lot of the stuff in the Shire booklet. So very cool for that. I always like really, I always like maps. <laughs> and I like maps that are well drawn that you can use in all variety of situations. So that's everything that's actually in the box itself. Let's take a look at the rules booklet. So here we have the rules booklet for the One Ring 2nd Edition and the starter kit. It's very bare bones. I'm fairly certain that everything is fleshed out even more in the actual core rulebook, which is, well, I hope so, because there's a lot that is missing here, as we'll see. So let's open it up and take a look at what we have. First off, we have a little bit of a prologue. We get an example of play, which I always find is more useful after you learn how to play. And I rather have it a little bit more detailed than just, you know, having the lore master, which is the GM here, just asking a bunch of questions of the players and them reacting to it. And then you get a little bit of some setting text. So this does take place in the third age, as I've said. And then we get some more specifics, like what's going on, um, structure of the game, and then we actually have our first bit of rules, which is action, action resolution. So when you make a roll, you take a look at your stats, and however many pips you have is how many dice you roll. Very much in line with the alien RPG that I've covered here. You have your 12-sided dice, which are called feet dice, and you always roll at least one of those. And one of them is a... Uh, complete success and the other one is a, uh, a zero it counts as a zero instead of an automatic failure and then of course you're trying to beat your target number for your uh, characteristics so either strength wits or heart and so there's a big old number right there on the character sheet that's the number that you're trying to uh, beat so if we take a look at Drogo Baggins here his target number for strength is 15 we would take, let's say we're trying to roll for a song here. Uh, we'd roll two. Actually, I probably should just do awareness. And you would try to beat a 15 here. So I got nine and then a three, which is 12. I did not quite beat that. Of course, there are other things that can give you some bonuses um, akin to advantage and disadvantage. Um, they're called favored rolls and ill-favored rolls here. You can... Take a penalty on dice as well, which means you're lowering your dice pool by however many dice. You have different conditions like weary and wounded. And weary is when your lose or it's when your endurance drops to a level equal to or lower than your your load score. So this game is all about traveling to different places, and it really makes good use of certain mechanics for traveling, such as weary. Wounded is a serious predicament for any adventure. Uh, basically, you get hit fairly hard and you take the wounded uh, stat here. Then you, of course, you have the bullet points of how to do a roll for a skill. And then they, we get a better explanation of characteristics from your target numbers for strength, heart, and wits, your, 
which are your attributes, um, some skills, all of the skills are detailed here on the next page. And then you have things like combat proficiencies, which are how well player heroes conduct themselves when engaged in battle. It basically gives you extra dice. You do have hope and parry to worry about as well, but that's actually further along. So for skills, there's actually quite a few number of skills. And I do like on this character sheet that um, it kind of follows the Power Rangers character sheet in a way where you actually have your... Uh, characteristic and then you have the skills that are associated with that characteristic below it I really do like that it draws your eyes to the right place so some of our skills we have are athletics awareness all battle courtesy craft in hearten um, that's to instill positive feelings in other people you can have things like explore healing hunting insight lore persuade Riddle, I'm kind of torn on that one. Um, riddle is to figure out like clues for a riddle, sure, but it's also in speaking in riddle. So like, let's say you meet a stranger on the road and you don't really want to tell them who you are or where you're from, then you would make a riddle roll to basically uh, beat around the bush. I kind of find that to be a little bit too specific of a role-playing skill like i would rather have my my players actually role play that out as opposed to making a skill check you have other skills like scan song which <laughs> like can't it just say it's performed because it's not just song it's reciting poems it's dancing it's anything you know that is a creative art <laughs> that just I mean, I get that song, singing and song is very is very heavily influenced in the Lord of the Rings mythos. I just it's it's performance. Let's just be honest. And then you have things like stealth and travel. For combat proficiencies, you have four to work with. You're either proficient with axes, bows, spears, and swords. And I'm not really that sold on that idea. Like, what if you use a mace? It doesn't really, I don't, it, maces doesn't really fit into any of those categories. But then again, I don't think there is a mace item in this. Yeah, I mean, the best we have is a club, which I think is axe. I'm not sure. But yeah, I'm, I don't really, I'm not really sold on the whole sorting them out into this category. And daggers aren't even listed as any of the possibilities. And there is a dagger card in there somewhere. Yeah, swords is uh, short swords, swords, and long swords. Of course, you can make brawling attacks. So why isn't there like, you know, fisted combat proficiency? I don't know. I'm just, I'm being very nitpicky. I don't quite agree with the combat proficiencies here. And then you have endurance and hope. Endurance represents a player hero's resistance and is taken into account whenever an adventurer is subjected to some form of harm. So that's your HP, basically. Of course, we've already done the weary condition, but you can rest. You can take a short rest, which I believe is an hour-long rest. And then you have a prolonged rest, which is where you gain all of your HP or your endurance back. Hope is... I wouldn't say it's the opposite of endurance because it's not tied to your mentality, but in a way it kind of is. It's like your spirit in a way. So hope is a hero's reserve of spiritual fortitude and positivity. A hopeful character can keep going when physical or when physically stronger heroes have already succumbed to despair. So you do have hope points and you can recover hope points. There are, at least in the adventures, there are some times where you would make a check to withstand losing hope. So, it's a very interesting concept. It's not really explained in great detail here, but it probably is in the core rulebook. Valor and Wisdom. Wisdom expresses the player hero's trust in their own capabilities, their self-confidence, and capacity for good judgment. Valor is a measure of hero's courage as tempered by dangerous deeds. Individuals of valor are willing to place themselves in danger for the safety of others. That's all 
that's pretty much it. It doesn't really say what else Valor and Wisdom is for. That's just it. Yeah. So that is kind of wasted to me. It doesn't explain anything. It just tells you, oh, these are two terms. Yeah, it might as well have been left out, honestly, and just saved for the core rule book because I'm sure that's explained better there. And then you have adventuring and how adventuring works. Basically, this is for the GMs. You have like an introduction, then you have some scenes, and then you have the end of the session. And then we have combat. So combat is... Huh, it's interesting to say the least. It's very different. So let's say that you spot an enemy from a distance. You can actually open up with a volley of ranged shots, whether from a bow or sling or whatever you have. And then as the enemy gets closer, or maybe you get closer, you initiate close quarters combat, which means you get into engaged range. So then you get to choose your stance. So all player heroes select whether they will fight the round in close combat or ranged combat. Player heroes can choose freely to fight in close combat at the start of each round, while they are allowed to fight in ranged combat only if there are at least two other adventurers fighting in close combat. So basically you have to keep the enemy away. Then you get into engage range, then you make attack rolls. Difficulty of all attack rolls by the player heroes is based on their strength, uh, target number, modified by the parry rating of the targeted enemy. Okay, then you lose endurance if you get hit, uh, special damage. So if you roll, what is that symbol? Uh, this symbol on the six. If you roll that weird T symbol, um, you can use those to trigger special damage from like a heavy blow. Um, for any weapon, you can fend off with any close combat weapon, or you can pierce with bows and spears, or um, two of those symbols for swords. And they all do uh, different, they all have different effects, which is pretty neat. And um, most adversaries are killed outright when wounded, unless specified in their description. Um, player heroes, on the other hand, can get the wounded status once without serious consequences but they risk more if injured a second time and there aren't any rules about death here like there's a little blurb about serious injuries and death and i guess since because this is a starter game they're not going to get into any detail about death which is i'm fine with i just hope they expand that in the core rule book so that's everything that's in the rule section let's take a look at the adventures book So the adventures book has five different short adventures that are fairly linked. Like um, there's a definite start and then there are two adventures that you can plug in anywhere. And then there are two additional adventures that basically happen back to back. So the conspiracy of the red book. This is the first adventure, a conspiracy most cracked. It starts off with Bilbo summoning the hero characters to his house on um, back end and he basically wants you to steal something um, from Michael Delving uh, that's a town by the way uh, Michael Delving is a place and so uh, you uh, go to this town to steal I believe it's a map of some sort a map of the entire Shire or something like that it's very old but also very valuable and it's just sitting there in like some museum or something like that and so this adventure is all about traveling and making some simple skill checks, introducing the players into making skill checks and being very role playing heavy. And that's something that I'll point out. Each of these adventures are very role playing heavy in a way. You're not just don't expect combat to be featured heavily in each of these adventures because there isn't any combat here in the first adventure. So the second adventure has the players going to find a uh, cudgel, I believe, um, in some other place, in up north. And so uh, the players have to travel to said place, um, figure out how to cross a river, and they inspect a uh, they inspect the place where this said cudgel is supposed to be. And they get all this information from the map, or Bilbo gets all this information from the map. And so they go, and they find out that it's already been taken by a thief. So they track down the thief, and lo and behold, the thief is being attacked by... Da -da -da -da, 
a troll. Jack the Stone Troll. So you fend off the troll or you can hold him off until it's dawn, in which case you know that trolls become stone. The Bull Roarers Club, by the way, is said item that you are looking for. And when the players get back, they meet Balin, son of Fundin. Most excellent fireworks. So Bilbo gets an idea one day that, hey, somebody's been using Gandalf's fireworks for my 11th, 100th birthday or whatever that phrase is called. And so he has the player heroes going out to find the remainder of the Grey Wizard's uh, fireworks. And so they go and they interrogate some people and they end up going into a cave where they meet a, um, an orc. Which kind of looks more like a goblin, to be honest, but whatever. And they can either talk to the uh, orc, convince it, or something like that, or they can fight it, deal a little bit of damage, and then it'll run away. And of course, there is a hobbit who is kind of hoarding the uh, fireworks, so you'll have to convince him as well to... Uh, relinquish some if not all of the fireworks into your possession the uh, next adventure involuntary postman has has the players getting captured which is kind of strange that's how the adventure starts off with uh, they get they're taken to jail or something like that it's really stupid and weird but only in a hobbit sense is it stupid they're causing so much mischief around the Shire that they're just put in jail for a little bit. And then, of course, uh, somebody comes in to uh, release them, but they have to deliver a letter. So they have to go all the way over to the west, or is it the east? I can't remember. And they uh, this is basically just a traveling montage slash bunch of skill rolls you do meet an elf galdor of the havens and he does kind of befriend the hobbits a little bit he makes sure that they are rested and they have food because it is a multi-day journey from what i understand and then they get to the next place which if i remember correctly um bilbo is there waiting for them or rather Bilbo is waiting back at the place where they're supposed to go. I believe Farmer Maggot gave them the letter to deliver. And when they get back to Farmer Maggot, Bilbo's there waiting for them. Oh, I planned this whole thing just to spring you out of jail. To sue the savage beast. So a beast is, go is roaming around the old forest attacking chickens. And Farmer Maggot wants you to deal with it in some way. And so it's up to the players to either trap it or just fend it off. Although, if you just kind of fend it off, it does come back, and you'll have to deal with that too, or you can trap it, or something like that. But the thing about it is, the beast itself has some interesting backstory. And I believe this is the part where you can meet um, Tom Bambadil. Yes. And he'll basically teach you a song that will quell the beast's anger or something like that. And so you go back and find the beast and you sing it this song. Some of your party members have to fend it off for a little while while one of your party members is singing the song and soothing it. And then it turns, it's no longer like a demon wolf dog thing or something like that. And you go back to Farmer Maggot and the dog follows you and it becomes Farmer Maggot's best friend and it's like really weird and it becomes the same dog that you hear about in like the Fellowship of the Ring and stuff like that. And then that's it. You do get a nice little epilogue um, and then it tells you that, hey, you can just go on to the Shire for more stuff. So let's actually take a look at the Shire book. The Shire book is definitely the largest of the three tomes that are included in the starter set. And that's because it gives you a history of the Shire, things that you'll need to know, things that I never knew, but then again, I'm not the world's biggest fan of the Lord of the Rings. And it's actually fairly interesting. Like, a lot of the lore that they put, like from the invention of golf by um, one of the hobbits uh, basically beating, like, clearing the head off of a goblin and it landing in a rabbit hole. That's how they invented golf and stuff like that. And then you have like a very specific detailed uh, description of like 
the different farthings from west farthing and you get like little different tables that you can use this one has an in gossip table there are different uh, side quests or like quest starters spread out throughout this book you have different npcs that are noticeable in said areas and stuff like that and then you have some gorgeous artwork by the way the south farthing which is very brief by the way the north farthing same type of uh, layout the east farthing which has a really cool like side story there about something about a ghost if i remember correctly and then you have buckland which technically isn't a farthing but kind of is and it's kind of explained here and there are different tables that you can roll for for different situations and that is actually it aside from the brief description of the old forest which don't go to the old forest although they do give you a little bit more backstory for tom bambadil and like if you're uh, lord of the rings buff there's nothing new here it's pretty much everything that you already know already so that is actually it for the shires just a lot of description things to uh, to expand for a campaign if you're just using the starter kit here so that is actually everything that is in the uh, starter set for the one ring second edition it is a nice little beginner's box um some of the adventures I am a little on the fence about because they're just really simple and short, but I think that's the point. And I think a lot of people who are attracted to this aren't necessarily going to be attracted to, you know, just a combat heavy game. And this, or at least what is presented here, definitely balances things out from a role playing perspective or like, you know, playing the game in a different way from having to worry about traveling and stuff like that which is it's a breath of fresh air but it's just not my thing and i'm not the world's biggest lord of the rings fan either so feel free to leave a comment down below give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series and subscribe if you would like to see more i will see you guys in the next video